الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. My dear brothers and I assume sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless every single one of you. Jazakallah here for the opportunity for allowing me to talk about shubuhat. Shubuhat in Arabic is the plural for destructive doubts. And today we're going to be talking about on how to deal with shubuhat, destructive doubts. And before I go any further, I can't give you everything. Usually we deliver 10 effective strategies on how to deal with shubuhat. But we don't have the time. But we're going to give you a few and I'm going to point you in the right direction to continue your spiritual journey. So we have a course called No Doubt on the Sapiens Institute learning platform. If you go to learn.sapiensinstitute.org, there is a free course called No Doubt, how to deal with your and other people's doubts. 10 effective strategies, essentially. We also have a free book written by Sheikh Fahad Taslim on the same issue is called No Doubt. If you go to the Sapiens Institute website, sapiensinstitute.org, there's a section called Read. After Read, there's a section called Books, and you could download the books for free. Everything is free, inshallah. And that is going to allow you to take today's talk further. Is that clear? Yeah. So we're going to be dealing with Shubuhat, how to address destructive doubts in the deen. Before we do that, we have to understand something about ourselves before we understand how to deal with shubhat. Why? Because a shubha, which is the singular for a destructive doubt, enters the heart of the individual human being. Or it sits on top of the heart of the human being. So we have to understand the human being before we understand the shubha before we understand how to address that particular destructive doubt. Why? Because if we have a misunderstanding of the human being, we won't understand how to deal with a destructive doubt entering or sitting on his heart. Because if we have an artificial understanding of the human being, based on a kind of Western psychology around 30 years ago, we will not really understand how to deal with these issues. We may think that everything is just like a computer system. You have a computer and the brain is like a computer and you have some inputs and some outputs. So if we just fix the inputs, we're going to fix the outputs. But even in today's modern psychology, cognitive psychology, cognitive science, they're moving away from that. The human being is far more dynamic than just a set of inputs and outputs. This is what they call a functionalist model of consciousness or the human mind, which we don't have to get, go, get into, it could be too complicated. But I'm just trying to say to you, if you have an artificial understanding of the human being, that you're just like a computer, then you think to deal with shubuhat is dealing with the inputs, the questions, the rationality. But human beings are not like that. Even modern cognitive science and mo modern cognitive psychology is talking about that too. It's a basic truth now that you may think you are intellectually convinced about something, but in reality, the basis for that conviction is not your intellect, but rather it's some kind of psychological or emotive factors. And anyone who's married will understand that. <laughs> no, no, it's not a Greenwich type of joke, is it? No, I do apologize. I'm from Hackney, you see, so from the other side. So let's understand the human being from a Quran and Sunnah perspective in order to deal with shubahat effectively. Why must we understand the human being from a Qur'an and Sunnah perspective? Because 
If you want to know the truth about the human being, you need to refer to guidance from the creator of the human being. Allah is Al Khaliq, He is the creator. He is Al Khalaq, the perpetually creating. It is Allah who created the human being, and Allah knows the human being better than the human being knows the human being. Allah knows Hamza better than Hamza knows Hamza. Wallahi. Because Allah has the picture, we just have the pixel, if that. We have a pixelated understanding of reality. Now, I can't open the door now to the differences of the p- opinion and all of the different scholastic discussions in normative orthodox Islam on human psychology. I'm just going to give you a schematic, a summary. I'm going to give you enough that is adequate for us to understand how to do shupahat from a Quran and Sunnah perspective. So when we're dealing with the human being, we have to understand the human being has a body. This is well known in the Islamic tradition. We have a body, a physical body. But we also have a fitrah. A, the fitrah, fatara, which you have words like fatrun and fatarahu, is the normative original disposition. The innate disposition or the natural disposition that Allah has created within us. That Allah has created within us. And we know this from the Quran and the Sunnah. For example, in chapter 30, verse 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says for us to adhere to the fitrah of Allah, to the natural way Allah has created us. Also, we have the Sahih Hadith, the authentic Hadith in Sahih Muslim. Where the Prophet ﷺ said that every child is born in a state of in fitra, in a natural state. And then the hadith continues, it's his parents that basically make him deviate away from that natural state. They make him into a Christian or a Jew or a Magian. So we have these two reference points. From an Islamic scholastic perspective, the ulama, there are two main opinions concerning the fitra. The first opinion, which I believe is the weakest opinion, or the lesser opinion, but it's still within the Islamic orthodoxy, is that the fitrah, there is knowledge within the fitrah, a basic form of knowledge. And what happens, is like the fitrah becomes clouded. You can't find this word in the Quran and the Sunnah, but it's a nice metaphor. It, the fitrah becomes clouded. Just like the Prophet said in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, it's the parents that basically get the child to move away from the fitrah. So the fitrah becomes clouded in a way. It's our job as du'at, as people who call to Islam, as Muslims who want good for human beings, want guidance for human beings, to help uncloud the fitrah, to awaken the truth within. And the truth within is the ulama discuss, for example, it's the belief in Allah, the belief in His unicity, in His tawheed, in His oneness. And some ulama talk about basic morality. There is a form of knowledge within the fitrah, but it becomes clouded. The stronger opinion is the opinion that there is no knowledge in the fitrah. But the fitrah is like a car. It's like a Lamborghini. And the Lamborghini has a windscreen. And the Lamborghini, if the windscreen is clear, the driver could drive towards destination haq, destination truth, Islam. But if the windscreen is clouded, then what's going to happen to the Lamborghini? It's going to crash. It's going to end up looking like my car. (laughs) I think it's 20 years old. Honda, uh, Toyota Verso, right? It's dying, yeah? We need to do car janaza soon, yeah? So it may just turn into my car. So, but if the windscreen is clouded, it will destroy itself, or it won't go towards destination haq, destination truth. But if the windscreen is clean, then it's going to continue towards the truth. It's important to understand the fitrah in that way. No no matter what opinion you follow, what we're going to say today still makes sense. So So the human being has a body, the human being has a fitrah, and the human being has a ruh, a soul. The thing which animates the body. Some ulama talk about the ruh as that which animates the body. 
gives it life. Also, the human being has a... What's this? It's not a heart, mate. It's not a heart, mate. It's a qalb. The qalb. And the qalb, coming from the root word, qalaba, qalaba, it, it wavers, it does taqallub. It wavers, it's keep on boiling over, it's wavering, okay? And the qalb has to be firm on iman. As Allah says in the Quran that no one's going to be safe on the day of judgment unless they come to Allah with qalbin salim, with a sound heart. But the qalb does taqallub, it wavers. So that's another part of the human being. Not only does the heart waver, but the heart has a function. Functions. And one of its functions is, who knows? The aql. The aql, the intellect. The intellect is a function of the qalb according to the majority of the ulama. So the qalb has to be firm on iman. But the qalb does taqallub, it wavers. And the aql is a function of this wavering heart. Not only does it waver, the qalb has fitan, tribulations. What are the two main fitan of the qalb? Who knows? Give me one of the tribulations of the heart. That's the different types of, 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 of kind of the soul. Yes, shahawat. Which that type of soul plays a role, but you have shahawat, and the second one is shubuhat. So blameworthy desires and destructive doubts. So all of these things, what well, I've mentioned, the body, the fitra, the ruh, the qalb, the aql, are all in a dynamic interplay. Like when the brother just mentioned one of the types of souls, this relates. All of these things are dynamic interplay. Why is this important to understand this schema? It's important to understand this schema because we're not going to think that dealing with shubuhat is just a rational exercise. Because if you think the human being is just a computer, then you're just going to change the input. But the human being is dynamic, as you can see, which is in line with modern psychology as well. It's catching up. These sciences catch up to the Quran and Sunnah, by the way. Yeah? They're playing catch up. So, since the aql, the intellect, is a function of the qalb, and the qalb can be diseased, and it has shahawat and shubuhat, then no matter how good the information is, no matter how good the argument is, if the qalb has shahawat and shubuhat, and by the way, we know the heart can have diseases as well, like kibr. Arrogance, ujub, self-amazement, hasad, blameworthy jealousy, riya, ostentation showing off. If the heart can be, if the qalb can be diseased and the qalb has shahawat and shubahat, no matter what you do to the aql, you're not going to be on truth. And our dawah these days, and I, I used to be blamed for this, I can't take blame anymore with all due respect. I've been spending good five more years talking about these things, but I do take responsibility. That we come across as if truth is a rational philosophical exercise. The thousands of people we have spoken to, the hundreds of people that we have mentored, we have come to the conclusion it's not merely a intellectual issue. And we're known to do with this intellectual stuff. We study all of these things, even in Western academia. We're doing PhDs, we've had we've got multiple postgrads in philosophy and so on and so forth and we realize that when you look into the Quran and Sunnah and you look into reality itself it's not an ugly issue we have something called lighthouse mentoring service and in lighthouse mentoring service we deal with shubuhat people who left Islam people who have doubts and we also deal with dua how to make them better we deal with new Muslims as well and non-Muslims but we also deal with major, the, uh, a lot of the cases, the majority of the cases are people who have shubuhat. Now, around 80 to 90 percent or 70 to 90 percent, when they come with an intellectual issue, we realize at the end it's a psychological spiritual issue. Allah is my witness. 
And that's why it's important to understand the human being as Allah talks about the human being. Sometimes we think the da'wah, we, it's like a different form of arrogance, isn't it? Or showing off. I'm going to prove him wrong. I'm going to refute him. I'm going to show him that he's wrong. I'm going to destroy his argument. And then you, you, you lose the person, right? Sometimes the art of da'wah is that you lose the argument, but you win the person. Because through your humility, maybe that could uncloud the fitrah to awaken the truth within or uncloud the fitrah so that person can be guided. The point I'm trying to say here is that it's not just about the aql. And that's why if you treat the human being like the functionalists do in the philosophy of the mind or how they used to understand the human being maybe a decade or so ago, then you're going to lose many human beings. Or you're going to come across maybe arrogant or not having the true intellectual and spiritual empathy. But if you treat the human being from the perspective of how Allah created the human being with a ruh, with an aql, with the qalb and so on and so forth and you understand that these things are all, they all have a dynamic connection then you know, okay, maybe his fitrah is clouded this way it's not an aqli issue, it could be a nafsi issue, a psychological issue and when you realize that you become far more mature in your da'wah and you're thinking, okay, is that really what he's about? Let me listen with the intention to understand the person. Because the art of da'wah is, is listening with the intention to understand, not pretending to listen. Yeah, mm, yeah, mm, mm. That type of listening is you're manufacturing a response while they're talking, right? Because usually when people say, but, you know they haven't listened, yeah? Are you listening to me? You don't need to say, but. Respond, oh, that's very interesting. You said this, what did you mean by that? Ah, you, you're intending to listen to the person, to truly understand the intellectual, social, and spiritual context, to truly connect with them so they could find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for us, we just, it's like a, we've already loaded the intellectual gun. They're talking, 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 boom. And then we lose the person, we destroy our argument, we destroy their argument, and we destroy the person, we destroy the relationship. It happens, right? Imagine I had a dawah table, and some guy called John comes up, and John's an atheist. He says, ah, Hamza, I'm an atheist. And I'm like, okay, he's an atheist, therefore he believes in Richard Dawkins, he loves science. And we're like, you know, cosmological argument, this and the other, and he's just looking at me. And then he says, oh, thank you, and then he walks off. But then after, so he goes to another da'wah stall with someone who is more connected to the Qur'an and Sunnah and the guy's listening, he's asking him questions, the brother's trying to find out his context How are you? How's your family? What's your life like? And then he realizes the only reason John is an atheist is not because of science is because his mom passed away when he was five years old from cancer and he doesn't have an answer Listening with the intention to understand is so important Not only that you need to love for everybody. I know people don't like this sometimes. You must hate the kuffar for all that nonsense, yeah? Well, that's nonsense. There is a difference between love for and love of. We hate kuffar, of course. Of course. But there's a distinction in the Quran and Sunnah concerning loving for someone and loving of them. I love the believers. I love for them and I have a love of them. For the kuffar, those who reject the truth, the disbelievers, I love for them, I don't have any love of them. Do you see the distinction? And we see this in the Quran and the Sunnah. There's a hadith in, narrated by Bukhari in Tariq al Kabir, and some ulama said this is Sahih. The Prophet said, Love for linnas. It's not akhihi, it's not your brother, it's the people for what you love for yourself. Even the famous hadith in the Arba'een of An-Nawawi, the 13th hadith, La yu'minu ahadakum hatta, and it continues, love for your brother what you love for yourself, you won't truly believe unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And nawawi himself, the classical scholar, he said this means insaniya, humanity as well. But from what perspective? We want goodness for them. We want goodness for them. The Prophet ﷺ was a mercy to the worlds, including Atheists, disbelievers, because he wanted guidance for them. So loving for others means that you want goodness and guidance for them. 
So when you're talking to a non-Muslim, you must want goodness and guidance for them. You, want, you are committed to their well-being. This doesn't mean you love kufr or you love rejectors of Allah. No, because we know Islam is very deep when it comes to these issues. There is a distinction between loving of and loving for. So, yes, so that's why it's important to understand the human being from a Quran and Sunnah perspective. So you see, okay, it's not always the case that this person is disbelieving or has a shubha, has a destructive doubt because of intellectual issues. It could be something else. And when we, and so in Lighthouse Mentoring Service and Sapiens Institute, when we deal with you, we realize this. And let me give you some ex similar examples that we've experienced. We had one guy. He came to us, it was a face-to-face -face mentoring. He became an atheist. And in the beginning, we were talking about, because he was doing the algorithm for some social media company, we were talking about consciousness, right? And that was my kind of topic for my masters. And he was like, you know, AI, artificial intelligence, can be fully conscious like a human being. I said, this is nonsense. Because fully conscious also means that you have inner subjective conscious experience in artificial intelligence. It's just a protraction of our own rationality, as William Haskell said. And there's a difference between syntax and semantics. And fundamentally, AI programs are fundamentally broken down to zeros and ones, which are electronic on and off switches. And those things have no way of putting meaning onto those symbols. This is a combination of syntax, symbolic things like zeros and ones, right? It has no way of taking the meaning and attaching it to the symbols. Anyway, I gave him the Professor John Sell Chinese rumors experiment. I gave him some objections. Anyway, the point is, he felt that artificial intelligence can be fully human. Like maybe you could marry them and this and the other, yeah? Which won't be surprising in the next 10 years. Watch this space. I'm, I'm making a prediction. In the next 10 years, you're going to have some moderate imams. They're going to be doing nikah with a robot. Artificial intelligence. I'm telling you. Remember this day. The signs are there. The signs are all there, yeah? I mean, in Japan, there were the, the, some guy married a cartoon, so yani, this, this, is, this is the world that we're living in, unfortunately. Look, if they don't know what a man and a woman is, surely they won't know what a human being is. So they're going to conflate the artificial intelligence with the human being anyway, so don't worry about it. But this is coming, and this is the intellectual social fit that's coming that we have to be prepared for from a Dao perspective. Anyway, so, the, so he felt human beings, can, uh, artificial intelligence can be, become fully conscious like human beings. And then, to cut a long story short, I said to him, hold on a second. I didn't use those exact words, of course, but I paused and I, or I gave him a question, which was, why do you reject Allah? Why don't you believe in Allah? Do you know what he said? He said, I don't believe in Allah because Allah has human-like names and attributes. Al-Rahman. Al-Alim, the most merciful, the most knowing, Al-Hakim, the wise, al bar the source of all goodness, the greatest benefactor. And I gave him Aqidah 101, basics. Laysa kimithlihi shay, there is nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe Allah's names and attributes are maximally perfect to the highest degree possible. We do not compare them, right, because that's a form of shirk. And we don't compare human attributes to Allah. That's also a form of shirk. One being deification, the other one being humanization, right? This is basic aqidah. I explained this to him. And even if the, the language is similar, but when you apply it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you apply it in the, defi the definite form. And you, you apply it from the perspective of his perfection and it's to the highest degree possible and it's transcendent. We affirm them, but we affirm his transcendency and his perfection as well. So I was explaining all of that, but then I understood there was a contradiction. And believe me, kufr, rejection of haq, rejection of truth, always contradicts itself. Because hold on a second, in the beginning of the conversation, he was happy for the creation of the human, the AI, to have the same attribute of inner subjective conscious experience, just like it's created the human. But in this case, he rejected Allah because the human being sound, you know, sounds like he has similar attributes to Allah. You, logically, there's a contradiction. Because on one, 
the creation of the human being, the AI, can have the same attribute as it's created the human, but in this case, it can't be the case when it comes to Allah and His creation. That is a logical contradiction because the logic, the door swings both ways. And I explained this to him and you see him, he stuttered, his mouth was open. I've got you. But I didn't do it in an egotistical way. Because if it's about ego at that stage, you don't want to win the person, you just want to show off. So what I did, I realized something else might be going on. And I knew this from before. I had some information. I said, talked about my father, my experiences, traumatic experiences. Not that my dad did anything wrong, it was my perception. And I had to change the meaning and then I fixed the relationship. And I said, maybe this is happening with you and this trauma can skew, can filter your understanding of the truth. When I mentioned that, this guy was a skinny, small guy, stood up, who I think he was shaking, he was crying. It's like I pressed a button and it was just Pandora's box, yeah? <laughs> and we had to calm him down, we had to change the subject. Anyway, to cut a long story short, his mother told us that his main issue was father figures. He had kind of a traumatic or negative experiences with father figures. He had nothing to do with his so-called argument. It started with consciousness and the philosophy of the mind and names and attributes and theology, but the basis of it was what? Daddy issues. I know that sounds, I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way, but it was to do with parents, traumatic experiences. <coughs> Another guy, Pakistani atheist, comes up to me after a lecture and says, Hamza, your argument for God's existence doesn't make sense because causality doesn't make sense outside of the universe. Now obviously I could say to him, you know, this is false, I could give him a Kantian response, I said you're assuming that causality or the nature of causal connections is a posteriori, it's based on experience, but I could maybe prove it's a priori, you need it before you experience anything to make sense of your experiences. I could have had this discussion with him. But that would be arrogant maybe, that would be not really truly being committed to his goodness and guidance. Maybe that's not me listening with the intention to understand. So do you know what I said to him? I basically said, what do you mean by causality? Because I've got a philosophy background, I know there's no ijma'a, there's no consensus in the philosophical tradition on the nature of the causal link. So what do you mean by causality? Because you have to know what you mean. If you're going to use that key term, that key word in a sentence that's trying to just prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So tell me, what does it mean? He didn't know. He basically said, I don't know. After having a bit of a discussion, I said, isn't it interesting that you're using a key term to reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You don't even know what that term means? And this for me was a... It was a... An indication. A qarina, an indication for... Something psychological going on. So I changed my tact, my strategy. And I said, look, come, let's sit down, we walked, whatever, stuff like that. Try to engage with him like on a human level. Do you know what he said to me? He said, Hamza, you know, I came from secular parents. I didn't know how to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll give you one more. Let's do the stories in threes. Yeah? Witter. Another guy. Asian guy, I think he was in Cambridge, went to his family's house. I spent about four hours with him. I like squeezed everything in my brain. There's not much, but I think the last drop just dropped. So I got a bit arrogant, unfortunately. And the Quran says the world is flat. That's why I reject this. You know, he was an empiricist, a Richard Dawkins fan, that kind of thing. So I got a bit arrogant. I said, yeah, the world's flat. Although I don't believe that. And I said, but I said, yeah, the Quran says the world is flat, whatever, stuff like that. I just turned the table and said, you prove to me it's round. No. Prove to me the world is round, man. Prove to me the world is round. You empiricist, everything is touch and feel. If I see it, I believe it. Go on, bro. Let's go hacking on you. Come on, bruv. I want to see it. Tell me, show me. That the world is round from your own reference point, from your own epistemology, from your own sources of truth. You prove to me the world is round. He was like, very arrogant. Oh, of course, the science books. Yeah? Did you see it yourself? This is testimonial evidence. You have to rely on the say-so of the scientist. Did you take those pictures? No. 
You're claiming to be touch and feel, you're claiming to be a Mr. Empiricist, but your basis of this truth now is someone else's say so. He says something like, oh, uh, you know, look at all the pictures on Google. Did you take them, bruv? I want to know if you took them. No. So you have to believe it's earth based on someone say so. Don't get me wrong, even in Western epistemology, which means the study of knowledge, testimony, they say so of others, is a valid form of, of, of uh, source of truth. It has a huge discussion, just like in the Islamic tradition. So I'm not, I'm not gunning it, but I was just using his own principles against him. I think he said something like, oh, if you get a rocket and you put a camera on the rocket and you shoot it up, you're going to see that the world is round. Have you done that? No. I think he said something like, if you go on a mountain, you can see the slight curvature of the earth. Have you done that? Even if you've done that, it doesn't prove it's round. That's an inference you're making. Maybe earth is a semicircle. Maybe it's a flower shape. Prove to me the world is round, bruv, with your own principles. <laughs> it was actually quite funny. Wallahi, this was from Allah. It was from Allah. It was one, you know these moments when you're in, in the da'wah? Allah gives you these things, then you, you just, it's Allah is saying, you've been naughty, but carry on. Yeah? And Allah is merciful and, and, and you know, this is not, nothing that we deserve. It's just a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an undeserved gift. Because if iman is a gift, imagine calling other people to iman. It's a compounded gift. Because Allah says in chapter 49 verse 17, He speaks to the Arabs who felt that iman was a favor to the Prophet And Allah says, say to them that iman is a favor from Allah. So, this was a gift for me that, that day. So he was changing colors. I think he also says, if you go on a plane, go in a straight line, you'll end up in the same place, which means the world is round. I said, have you done it, bruv? No. I'm telling you, he had no direct empirical answer. Anything that he could refer to in the empirical world, that he could reason over and make a strong inference. He had nothing. And that was the basis for his so-called rejection. Do you know what he said at the end? And he was a bit smug about the whole thing as well. <laughs> Said so I got it. The shadows. Do you know what I said to him? Indeed, in the alternation of the night and day are signs for people who understand. The Quran itself. The alternation, when Allah uses the word taqweer, right? Which comes from the root to take a turban and to wrap it around a round head. The only answer he had is the answer that the Qur'an gives on these issues. And I basically said to him, you arrogant so-and-so, you were pointing the finger at the Qur'an, three fingers were pointing back. The only answer you can find based on your own principles was from the Qur'an itself. And this for me was an indication that something else was going on and I was told that the re he had a very successful online gambling business. It had nothing to do with flat earth or round earth. These are three nice stories I think would stick to you, right? Which gives you an understanding of the human psychology. Now, so how do we do with, with shubhat? Now the first thing to do, let's just define what a shubha is. The scholar Al-Fayyumi, he says a shubha resembles something that it's not because tushbihu. It's resembling something that it's not. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. It is falsehood dressed up as truth. That's why Ibn Taymiyyah, he noted something very important concerning Shubuhat. The famous 14th century polymath and theologian, may Allah have mercy on him. He said that the reason a Shubha is taken seriously because there's an element of truth. There is like a tinge of truth, but it's false. That's why people take them seriously sometimes, because they're like wolf in sheep's clothing. If you don't have distinctions, you can't make distinctions, you may not have the knowledge or the spiritual insight or whatever the case may be, you may not know that actually it's a wolf because it's dressed up like a sheep, right? So, which is very interesting. So, a shubha is something that tries to resemble the truth, but it's not. Also, a shubha is different from waswasa and is different from valid questions. This is very important. This is a strategy, in fact, it's a strategy that we discuss, but I'm not going to really entertain it as a strategy now, but I think it's important from a definition point of view. 
A shubha is not a valid question and a shubha is not waswasa. So let's make a distinction. A waswasa are shaitanic whisperings usually that come to you that you do not believe in and you actually hate. You have an aversion for them. So something may come to you and you're like, ah, you, you know you don't, because if you were to write it down, you know you don't believe it's true and your heart does not connect with it. That's waswasa in, in the context of this discussion. The Sahaba had the, these types of waswasa. And they went to the Prophet ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ said, this is a sign of Iman. So this is a sign of Iman. But there are some conditions. The conditions are that you don't believe in the waswasa, in, the, in that whispering. And you have a psychological aversion to it. Because the, the Sahaba were like, you know, essentially they were saying we hate these things. And the Prophet ﷺ says in two different ahadith, I believe, that you should not speak about them. Ignore them and don't act upon them. Those three things. Okay? So that is waswasa. And it's a sign of iman. Okay? It's a sign of iman. So when people have waswasa spiritual kind of whisperings, then know that this is a sign of iman. As long as you don't believe in it, that you have an aversion to it, and you shouldn't speak about them, act upon them, and don't speak about them. Don't act upon them and don't, like people and don't like people knowing about them. Okay, good. Zakhahir. So, I tell you the hadiths now so we're a bit more scholastic on this issue. One hadith is in Sahih Muslim, the other hadith is in Bukhari. It was narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu an. Some of the companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to the Prophet and said to him, We find in ourselves thoughts that are too terrible to speak of. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, are you really suffering from that? They said, yes. He said, this is a clear sign of iman, of faith. So you could see the sahaba had a rejection of this. They didn't believe it was true and they didn't like it. That's a sign of iman. And, and that's a sign that it's a waswasa. It's not a shubha and it's not a valid question. In the other hadith in Bukhari, Abu Huraira radiallahu an said, and he ascribed this back to the Prophet sallam, Truly Allah has overlooked for my, for, for my ummah that which is whispered or the which is thought about in the lower self as long as they do not act upon it or speak about it. Those two things, okay? So that's, those are waswasa. Then you have valid questions. A valid question really is any question in Islam. Apart from questioning the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the deen teaches us not to think the unthinkable. Like, can an elephant think like an ant? Say, assumingly they both think. Can they think like each other? No. By greater reason, it's not analogy, we don't make analogies with Allah, but a for theory, by greater reason, how can we even think about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He's a transcendent being, maximally perfect being. We have limited, contingent, cognitive faculties. It's impossible. Don't think the unthinkable. Don't think the unthinkable because it doesn't, doesn't lead anywhere. It's actually irrational to do so. It's like me saying to this beloved brother, my dear brother, can you tell me what that dog is thinking about? <laughs> do you know what I mean? No one's going to know what Netanyahu is thinking about. Kalb. Right? Allah destroy him. So, do you see my point? Because you're different, different realms. By greater reason, we can't even think like the about the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unless Allah has given us knowledge about Himself through the Quran and the Sunnah. So, you, valid questions are basically anything apart from the essence of Allah, but there are some conditions that they do not come from an aqli space or a qalbi space where you uh, want to undermine the foundations of Islam or you were to distort the religion. Those two things are very important. As long as your question or what you talk about doesn't come from a psychological intellectual space where you want to undermine the foundations or you believe that they're not true or you want to distort the religion or you believe it should be distorted, as long as it doesn't come from that space, it's a good question. 
A shubha, therefore, is any statement or any question that comes from the intellectual and spiritual space that you want to undermine the foundations of Islam and you want to distort the religion. So, for example, the same question from two different people, what for one could be a valid question, for the other it could be a shubha. For example, you could go to a sheikh and say, you know, I can't prove God exists. Can you prove God exists for me? Now that could be a valid question because the person asking the question doesn't need proof. He believes in Allah. Just like I believe my mother is the one that gave birth to me. I've got no real proof for it. It's fitri. It's haq al-yaqeen. It's not ilm al-yaqeen. It's not ayn al-yaqeen. It's not like testimony or knowledge based. It's not experience based. It's I'm living the reality. If I'm having a sweet mango, you know, I don't need to prove to myself it's sweet. I'm not only experiencing it, I'm in the reality of the sweetness, right? So, the point here is, they already believe in Allah, but they just want to know how to prove it to others. Valid question. Nothing wrong with that question. And they could talk about the fitrah, they could talk about the design argument in the Quran, they could talk about chapter 52 verses 35 to 36, when Allah talks about, did you come from nothing? Did you create yourself? Did you create the heavens and the earth? Indeed, you don't have any certainty. So I call it the Quranic argument for God's existence. It's amazing. Anyway, the point is, he could give him that. Another person could ask that question, but it's coming from a psychological and spiritual space of, I don't believe in Allah. I need an answer. Do you see? So two, the same question from two different, for, for two different people, one would be a valid question, the other would be a shubha because he's already undermined the religion of Islam because he doesn't believe in the foundations, one of the foundations. Yes, brother. So Ibrahim would ask, ask Allah about life and the, I think in Maida the, the disciples asked Isa about, about table spread. So yes. Then, so those two questions, do they come under? One to undermine doubt. Yes. So because they both had, don't you believe? Yes. So sorry for no, 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 no. This was not a discussion on the fact that there is a creator for the heavens and the earth. It was about who is the creator for the heavens and earth. Who is the Rabb? Ibrahim alayhi salam. I went through this with Sheikh Ujjari, and I, I. It's very fuzzy in my mind, and when it's fuzzy. I have a responsibility, I'm going to not talk about it. But I know it's not about that this uh, prophet was undermining, for example, the fact that there is a creator of the heavens and the earth. He wanted to find out, okay, who is, who is the creator that I want to worship, right? And there are two opinions and discussions on this issue. And I remember raising it with Sheikh Ujjari and he answered it really well, but I just don't remember, sorry. So I'm not going to give you the... Topic, but it doesn't affect what we're talking about today anyway, yeah? But they're very good questions. And for, for other scenarios, it was about elevating the, the, the level of yaqeen. So there's a difference between ilm al yaqeen and ayn al yaqeen and haq al yaqeen. For example, someone can tell me that I trust that my house is on fire. That's yaqeen, I'm certain, because I trust the guy. And that's ilm al yaqeen, for example. I can see that my house is on fire. That's ayn al yaqeen. But there's another level of yaqeen which is even higher. I'm in the house and I can feel the fire. Yeah, that's haq al yaqeen. Yeah, may Allah protect the houses. Yeah. So, do you see my point? So, but just ask someone else who's, who remembers exactly the nuances behind these things. I actually don't remember. I do apologize. Yeah. So, yeah. So, there's a difference between valid questions. Uh, so, a person could have a, the same question but two different. One person, it could come from the space of it being a shubha, a destructive doubt, and another perspective of the person um, just wanting to know, but they have belief. They're not undermining, or they haven't undermined the foundations of Islam, or want to distort the religion. Or it could even be a statement in itself as well. Is this clear so far? Question, yes. Um, I wanted to also ask, what if the person themselves wants to get rid of the doubts that they have... Um, for example, they are undermining the deen of Allah, for example, they understand that and when they go and approach the shaykh and ask the shaykh a certain question, is it allowed for them to ask that question? Would it be, I guess you can say, undermining? That's a very good question, Zakhla was a very good question. So the brother is basically saying that if someone knows that they have a shubha, 
and they want the question answered to deal with it, are they undermining the religion? In the majority of cases, in my view, when someone knows it's a shubha and they want an answer, they still believe. That, why is it troubling you then? Yeah, it's troubling you. And someone who understands the various strategies that we teach in the course, they'll give you what's appropriate for you. Someone may need a complicated argument. Someone may, may need just a wake-up call. Someone may need just... It, just connecting themselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It's different strategies for different people But that's a very good question And that's why we're going to go through some of the strategies So these, these this, so it's important that we spend time on this Because we now know there's a difference between Valid questions, a shubha and waswasa Clear? So let's go through some strategies in a very quick way But please, I don't like people taking these kind of lectures And thinking it's ilm and thinking it's It's just planting seeds Yeah? You know, I was talking about this, uh, who was I speaking to? I was speaking to someone about this concerning, you know, we've kind of... I don't know if this is true or not, it's my intuition. In, in many cases, we've made Islam like a refined form of Christianity, you know? Unfortunately, in the West, big conferences, this, that, and the other, and people think it's ilm, and, and I think it's really sad, yeah? I know there's, there is space for it, I'm not saying it's bad, but we have to have a, a more mature strategy. And I usually say this, don't think this is any ilm. This is just a seed, or it's like a button that opens a door for you to continue your journey. Yeah? So the things that we're talking about, please sit with the sheikh, read some books with the sheikh, uh, go to our extensive course on this particular issue with Sheikh Fahad Taslim and so on and so forth. So you grow. Yeah? Don't think, ah, I've spent 45 minutes, now I could do with all the shubahat in the world. It doesn't work that way. Yeah? And the reason I'm kind of saying this because I saw a comment, which I don't always look at comments on, there was some big conference and the person said, oh, I met these mashayikh and I gained so much ilm that day. I'm like, bruv, it was one hour, two hour talk. I mean, I mean who remembers what happened in the talk? I tell you, let's be honest, even when you write notes, because people, you remember how you made them feel, sorry, people remember how you made them feel, not necessarily what you said. I know that as an instructor and speaker And I, I want us to change, move away from that narrative Because it doesn't, pref, it doesn't, pref, it doesn't prepare them for the, the trials and tribulations That are going to occur in the future inevitably by living in the West Social trials, intellectual trials, Iman trials This is like what I call spiritual insulin Because we have spiritual diabetes You listen to something, it's like an injection of spiritual insulin And now, hey, I'm somebody I'm not gunning it, it's needed, it's part of the process, but we need to be more mature and develop a much better strategy on getting people from this stage of the process to the stage where we want them. Is that clear, yeah? Okay, so let's deal with some of the strategies. So how do we now deal with some of the shubahat? Number one, and this in my view is probably the most important, your environment. We know that hadith on this issue. You're going to be upon the religion of your friends. You're going to be raised with the ones that you love If you go to the blacksmith, you're going to have burnt clothes You're going to smell of the blacksmith If you go to the itr seller, you're going to smell of perfume You are your environment You are the product of the four or five people around you Don't think you're smart, you're a leader This is complete nonsense and arrogance It's complete liberalism actually Because it individualizes the human Makes them, you know, as if they're just a desert island I'm rational, I'm an individual Society is not going to affect me That's the greatest joke because we even know from social psychology, this is not the case. For example, if you look at the development of the social, social norm, you have something called normative in, no, uh, social normative influence. So informational social influence and normative social influence. Informational social influence is based on our need to feel certain. Everyone wants to feel certain about something. But if you don't get that certainty from yourself or your subgroup, you're going to go to the dominant group because they're dominant. And that's why a lot of women sometimes become feminists. Because that's the dominant frame in, in the West. That's why a lot of, unfortunately, brothers and sisters become liberals or secularists or even atheists at university because that's the dominant frame. Don't tell me it's intellectual. Atheist is the dumbest thing on planet, on planet Earth. It's stupid. Allah says, only a fool would reject the way of Abraham. Right? They don't have any certainty. Right? Ilhad in the Arabic tradition comes from the word lahad. You know the lahad in the, in the grave, the sunnah graves. The lahad is the side pocket that is dug. 
So ilhad is a deviation. It's a deviation from the norm. Yeah, it's imprudent. It's unwise. It's baseless. So it's not an argument. It may be couched in sophisticated language, but when you look at the basis of it, it's like total nonsense. Anyway, so they get affected because they don't get certainty from the subgroup. And that's why it's important as Muslim communities in the West, we need to develop communities that are together, that we open the door. You know, if someone wants to come into the masjid, that they have quirky ideas, may look a bit different. We have to open the door of rahmah for them. We can't push them away because they'll go to the dominant group. We need to create an environment of yaqeen, an environment of certainty, an environment of belonging. The other one is called normative social influence, which is about belonging. Human beings have a need to belong with social animals. And the psychologists say that if you don't get belonging in a particular group or your subgroup, you're going to get it from the dominant group. Right? Say guy goes to university. He prays, he fasts, he doesn't know much about Islam, but he believes it's part of his fitrah, you know? And then he goes to university. It's a dominant group now, secularists, liberals, atheists, some of them are, God knows what, yeah? And starting to have some ideas, wants to start to belong to them a little bit because now he's sharing an apartment with them or a house, a student house. Then when he comes on the weekends or holidays at home, He's maybe sharing some of these ideas and people are pushing him away. He's not getting a sense of belonging. No one's really addressing him. No one's making him feel part of the home now. He's going to go to the dominant group. This is basic psychology, by the way. And there are various studies done, very famous studies, that even academics that have their peers, meaning other academics around them, and they've been told to lie about for example, the length of a line, which is so obvious on the screen, which line is bigger, right? If because their peers are telling them the false thing, they're more, the, the, the probability increases of them also agreeing with the blatantly false thing. Don't think just because they got a PhD, bruv, that they're smart. The most stupid, I'm doing a PhD on, on the Quran in Cardiff, yeah? Alhamdulillah, two of my supervisors are ulama, which is very rare in a secular academic institution to have supervisors that are actually ulama. So Allah made it easy for me, yeah? Alhamdulillah. But don't think some of the most stupidest people are PhD people. Aren't permanent head damage. A permanent head damage, absolutely. Oh. <laughs> That's the first time I heard that. I'm gonna use that chef. I'm gonna copy no copyright, yeah. I'm gonna take that. Permanent head damage. But it's true. Because don't get me wrong, sometimes if you're not sincere, if you don't have ikhlas and you get into academia, you start to have ujub, which is like a form of arrogance, isn't it? It's arrogance without anyone else. It's like you think, you know, it's all me, right? And that could actually affect the way you perceive reality. Yeah? 